My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, as chairman of the British Geotechnical Association, it is a great honour and a privilege to welcome you to Imperial College for the 58th ranking lecture. As usual, tonight's lecture has been webcast live to an international audience, and I welcome our online audience and also to those of you in the Overthrow Lecture Theatre here at Imperial College. Good evening to everyone. This, the 58th ranking lecture, will be delivered by Dr. Nico Reardon of Arab. The title of this lecture is Dynamic Soil Structure Interaction, Understanding the Holocene, Instrumenting the Anthropocene. Now, to formally introduce the lecturer, I call Mr. Olivier Martin, Technical Director in Charge of Railway Projects at Bouygues Travaux Public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure to introduce the 58th ranking lecturer. Dr. Nick O'Riordan. Nick grew up in Billy Roque in, in rural Essex and went to King Edward VI Grammar School in Chelmsford, where his talent for scientific discipline was only challenged by his interest in art and mural painting. In 1974, Nick graduated from King's College in London under the leadership of Professor Kevin Nash, and in 1977, he received his PhD, supervised by Professor Bob Gibson, on the subject of consolidation and settlement characteristic of interbedded alluvial deposits. During this period, he was also attached to the Engineering Geology Unit of the BGA, under the leadership of Roger Crutchley when it was conveniently located in the basement of the Geology Museum, about 100 meters south of where we are today. The same year, 1977, Nick joined the Arab consulting firm to work on the British Library and to model London clay with Dr. Brian Simpson. Nick became a director of the firm in 1997, and after 40 years, stand within the small group of experienced expert engineers able to deal with most uncommon engineering problems. Loyalty, desire to learn, excitement certainly explain this long-lasting and brilliant career. It is rare and it is valuable. Nick works on many aspects of uh, ground engineering during these four decades and have chosen to one of the project per decade in order to give you some flavor of his work. In the 80s, the Ravenspoon North offshore oil platform in the North Sea was the first concrete gravity-based platform built on the English sector. And this was a milestone as it completely modified the perception of economy between steel jackings and concrete oil platform. In the 90s, the foundation of La Tour Sans Fin in Paris with a cigar-like shape and, and endless extremities. It was at that time the highest building in Paris and had a slenderness ratio, eight over base of about 10, which was exceptional at that time. In the early 2000s, Nick worked on HS1, the first English high-speed line uh, where trains move at 300 kilometers per hour, especially challenging when crossing the, the uh, Thames marshes. Nick then moved to live in, in Italy and California, and I would like to give my respect to Madame Oriordan and family, which is here in the audience tonight, and also who listened to the conference on the net. In Italy, Nick worked on the new HSL station in Firenze, and in America, 
on the Gerald, Gerald Desmond Bridge uh, in California. This bridge was the first cable state bridge in California, flying over the entry to the port of Long, uh, of Long Beach with high pylon and severe earthquake loadings. Since 2015, Nick has been much involved with the development and construction of the Mexico City Airport Terminal, which lies on Virgin Clay with risk of subsidence and large and long-lasting earthquakes. The Mexico City Airport concept has the shape of a long boat looking like a catamaran. To float, remain stable, and return operational after a long earthquake. Fluctuat nec mergitur, would say the French and the Parisian people. The project perfectly illustrates Nick's approach. A wider view, a rigorous methodology, and the power of the numerical analysis. Nick has worked with renowned architect Jean Nouvel in Paris, Sir Norman Foster in Florence, Barcelona, and Tokyo, Pedi Clark Pedi in San Francisco, and Fernando Romero in Mexico City. He finds extra motivation integrating multidisciplinary environment and pushing engineering out of its comfort zone. My favorite project is the next project, as Nick used to say, and this would have pleased Rudy Hart Keeping. Nick is a delicate friend and a charming person, always eager to convince decision maker to adopt the correct solution, and all this is really the essence of engineering. In 2006, I remember visiting Nick in the Arab lab near Birmingham. We were developing the GoTrain project and in, Johannesburg, John, sorry, in Johannesburg, when you are faced with a difficult issue, you evade into the wilderness, you listen to the nature, and you seek the help of the elements. And indeed, it was a good, a good point because it was spring and the Arab lab was surrounded by savanna. In such an environment, I was positively convinced that we would ultimately find the best solution. And Nick translating the, the risk of large instantaneous sinkhole in dolomitic ground into an elegant equation a new classification, and a simple construction of foundation. It was smart, it was economical, and it convinced our client. Eventually, it pleased the whole engineering community of South Africa. For us contractors, it is absolutely fundamental to develop well-integrated, elegant, and affordable solutions. Sometimes this lies beyond the codes and standards, but we need to go for them, especially as today concession projects generally include severe unresolved difficulty or create a first in the profession. Nick development on GoTrain was significant and it helped us enormously. Nick is presently Arab Global Geotechnics skill leaders he has been a visiting professor at Southampton University and an industrial fellow at Bristol University. Discussing with my friend Roger Story about the technical interest and appeal on young doctorates, I remember my academic years at UC Davis, studying on the 19 Rankin Lecture by Professor Seed. Published two years earlier, it represented at that time the highest level of knowledge. It was just fantastic for a student. Today, no border and no limits exist between creativity, innovation, research, and development. And the academic world is closely connected to practice. At Bouygues Travaux Public, we are absolutely enthusiastic with the committee's choice to name for 2018 a practitioner that can hold the relay button of the highest technical frontier and provide incentive to all 
whether in the lab, in the office, or on site. On behalf of the British Geotechnical Association, it is an honor to invite Dr. Nick O'Riordan to deliver the 58th Rankin Lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Olivier, for your very kind words. Uh, Olivier came here by uh, Eurostar, I think, uh, across hi High Speed One, and very loyally he does tell me that the ride quality is better this side of the channel than uh, in the North Pas de Calais. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I'd also like to thank uh, the great deep honour uh, that I have in giving this uh, 58th ranking lecture from the BGA. Thank you very much indeed. It is obviously something daunting, but uh, I did want to stress that uh, uh, there will be no merchandising after the event. Um, uh, however, on the web, I've managed to find this quite uh, fetching hoodie with the right sort of sentiment, uh, ranking. It's a thing uh, you wouldn't understand. Anyway, uh, trying to connect what I'm going to be talking about this evening with uh, uh, the, the hairier uh, ranking, um, I managed to uh, link um, where, where Bouygues is from uh, on the outskirts of Paris uh, with Rankin through an early piece of work that Rankin did. In fact, it's ICE paper number five, uh, 595 on the causes of unexpected breakage of the journals of railway axles. Uh, there was a, an enormous uh, train crash um, uh, which uh, killed between 50 and 200 people on the way back from the... Uh, coronation party of uh, King Louis the, Philippe I uh, in, in 1842. And Rankin used his powers of observation to look at these fractured axles which caused the, uh, the derailment. And uh, uh, all that remains of the paper itself, there was a, a meeting which took place and uh, all these words which you won't be able to read, uh, explain how Rankin uh, uh, talked about fracture propagation. And this was at a time when people had not really um, grasped how fractures uh, propagated in metals. Um, an extraordinary piece of work. He was just 25 then. Um, he was, uh, managed to demystify um, this aspect of metallurgy at the time. And obviously, he went on to much greater things with thermodynamics and so on and so forth, as well as uh, uh, earth pressure uh, coefficients. But uh, there is a, uh, a repetitive loading um, aspect to uh, what Rankin did. So I will be talking about uh, dynamic soil structure interaction, extreme events, acute and repetitive. Um, with uh, acute extreme events, I'll be talking a little bit about car crashes and vehicle restraint systems, uh, and then landslide and cast collapse of the type that uh, Olivier mentioned. I'll be looking at repetitive extreme events, those with a period of around about 10 to 20 seconds, which will be wave loading offshore, uh, those in the sort of intermediate range, which are train loading, um, bending wave effects, what happens as you get closer and closer to uh, uh, quite high speeds in norm on normal soils. And then uh, finally, I'll be looking at earthquakes, tall buildings, deep excavations, soft clays and rafts, and city block effects. Um, I subtitled the, uh, um, uh, the uh, lecture uh, mentioning instrumenting the Anthropocene. Now, just to be clear, the Anthropocene is the current geological age, which we are, um, are creating, in effect. Uh, it's where human activity has been the dominant influence on the environment. Um, this next slide uh, shows a completed building in Bangkok. Uh, uh, it is completed, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we see here the complexity now in, da uh, in these downtown areas where you have metro systems, uh, above ground, below ground, you have buildings of all shapes and sizes, close to, distant from um, uh, each other, and basically all of our textbooks have tended to consider one thing at a time. Uh, the uh, um, you know, classical settlement uh, calculations are done with one thing uh, and it's in splendid isolation. Um, everything is connected now 
urbanization uh, as a result of improved um, uh, medical conditions and, uh, 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 and, and the like, uh, economic pressures and so on, urbanization is with us and we as geotechnical engineers have to be alive to uh, the challenges of dense urban fabric now in uh, the sort of things that we do, whether it's above ground and uh, whether it's below ground. Um, in some places, such as around uh, Tottenham Court Road in that picture in the sort of upper middle, um, at centre point, there's very little, gra there's very little ground left. Um, we're particularly interested in the way in which uh, buildings react against each other and, and alongside each other, and the way in which uh, they, um, they can influence um, performance of these um, structures. Um, if we look at uh, San Francisco downtown in the, uh, in the period, 30 year period from 87, before the Loma Prieta earthquake, um, and compare it to the situation today, this is um, the south of market area, um, where we have a, um, uh, in a sense, uh, a glaciated lowland geomorphology. And if I can just sort of pick the arrow up somehow, Yep. So roughly along, along the line traced there, there's an 80 metre deep uh, infilled uh, glacial valley um, under, under pretty well, well aligned under Market and Mission Streets. And uh, this is precisely the area where um, uh, the city fathers have chosen to develop the, uh, the downtown area. There's rock either side of it and uh, uh, there's Rincon Hill uh, roughly from where the photo is taken uh, up here and uh, across to, to Russian Hill, but in between there's a, a complex geology of uh, quite deep, um, deep deposits. So if you can concentrate on um, Alcatraz and the uh, uh, Transamerica Pyramid there, well I fast forward to 2017, uh, this is now the situation in, in downtown um, San Francisco, and I will briefly introduce you to uh, two recent buildings that I've been involved with, the uh, Salesforce Tower in here, um, which uh, is taller than the Shard in London, so it's about uh, you know, 330 metres tall, and uh, 181 Fremont, uh, the first externally braced uh, um, building in, in, in the city, um, which is uh, a little bit, uh, uh, just a little bit lower than the Transamerica Pyramid uh, here. Also, there is the uh, Transbay Transit Centre, which is this wavy white thing that sort of goes about five city blocks past these tall buildings, and there will be yet another tall building which will obscure the view roughly where the, uh, the cursor is there. So that's another big building to come. Uh, so you can see we're not dealing with a greenfield anymore. All these buildings will interact. Uh, San Francisco is between 15, uh, between two uh, faults, 15 kilometres away from the, uh, the centre, the uh, active San Andreas and Hayward Faults. Uh, so there's an ever-present risk of um, difficulty there. If we look at Mexico City, a mega city on soft ground, the um, uh, view I'm taking, I've shown where the photo is taken from. It's taken from the sort of rocky area on the west, looking across the blue area, uh, which is taken from the, uh, the geotechnical zoning code. Um, <coughs> and uh, shows uh, the dense urban fabric, uh, which, if you like, I will draw the boundary of what we can call the Anthropocene. This is the man-made urban fabric of the city, um, which, uh, which stretches out for um, nearly 20 kilometers from the rock on the west, west side through, to, through the soft clays and the lake bed deposits. And we are... Uh, currently building in this quite large area in the hitherto unbuilt part of the lake bed, uh, the new um, Mexico airport, international airport. Um, now, back in uh, 1999, uh, Reynoso and Ordaz um, published some interesting data from uh, the uh, recording station, seismograph recording stations deployed through the urban fabric and uh, if we um, enlarge that image, basically what this shows is that you get high spectral amplification at a period of around about four seconds, something like that. Now at the time, 
this appeared to be a basin effect, and it's uh, sort of gone into uh, classical uh, uh, seis seismic engineering as the site where there is a basin effect. Uh, however, now that we are working on the, uh, uh, the Virgin Lake where no one has built before, we find that actually this effect is probably an urban effect and we get uh, second phase beating, which I'll show later on in the presentation, from the urban fabric itself. So you get an early earthquake effect, and then you get the inertial effect from the urban fabric, which then adds to the, the beating, which goes on for hundreds of seconds, uh, at around about uh, uh, between four and uh, six second period. So the Anthropocene is directly influencing the way these dense urban systems react to extreme events. The main components of dynamic uh, source structure interaction are shown in this slide. We need to characterize all of these things. Um, I'm just listing them out here, and I'm mindful uh, that uh, there is, is going to be a uh, published paper uh, where I'll be going into much more detail uh, with all of this uh, to carry uh, uh, carry forward some of the, the ideas that I'm presenting uh, this evening. Uh, now, if I put my um, design management hat on, um, uh, dynamic soil structure interaction, the choice to go into numerical analysis rather than use pseudo-static or simplified methods to analyze a particular situation, I'm afraid you have to choose uh, at some stage because uh, if you do, then the structural engineer needs to sit close. Uh, forces and displacements, forces that structural engineers love and displacements which we love as geotechnical engineers, they are um, two things that uh, uh, have to work together. Uh, so soil st structure interaction is as much of a social, uh, social thing as a technical uh, enterprise. <laughs> uh, we need to be prepared for complexity. Um, uh, soil modelling often requires non-routine soil testing and you have to budget for all of that sort of time uh, and so on. Close supervision of laboratory procedures is often needed as labs are often uh, uh, ill-prepared, we, we, we could say, for the sort of um, things that we're after in terms of getting the right uh, characterization of soil. Uh, fortunately, we have a long history of um, excellent uh, applied mathematicians and applied uh, uh, the, the history of applied mechanics teaching uh, has been fantastic. So there are wonderful closed form solutions uh, that we can go back to and tie uh, our um, uh, advanced uh, numerical analyses back, back to those uh, closed forms. Um, often dynamic analysis can educate pseudo-static analyses as well and the codes, uh, we can then find uh, what codes kind of mean and kind of don't mean. And in that context, we can innovate and uh, um, make a big difference. Um, we, we must go 3D. Um, time and again, we're confronted with um, averaging effects and uh, trying to analyze things in 2D. Uh, these days, uh, the power of computers is such that we can certainly go 3D very easily. And uh, I'm... Uh, pleased this evening to be able to show many uh, examples of, of 3D dynamic analysis. Um, 2D smearing uh, can obscure critical mechanisms and uh, there are innumerable examples uh, of that. And optimization, using the tools that we have, all the toys in the box, so to speak, can bring uh, economic, elegant, surprising and delightful solutions. If you don't go for it, then pseudo-static analyses and simplified methods can reduce interaction, the need for interaction between structurals and geotechnicals, and that might be a good thing um, uh, from a um, project management, design management point of view, you know, just sort of uh, lob the answer over the wall and uh, run for cover, um, or potential for oversimplification and inappropriate use of uh, uh, whatever guidance uh, or awareness is, 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 can be uh, awareness raising that can be extracted from codes. Uh, there is the potential for over-design and excessive use of materials. Optimization is nearly impossible. Uh, and often pseudo-static analyses can demonstrate gaps in, uh, in knowledge and understanding. Um, and then you find late on in the day, in the lifetime of a project, that dynamic analysis has to be done anyway. So um, 
you are damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in this sort of context. So if we start with a, uh, a vehicle crash, this is a finite element analysis of a, uh, a super light vehicle uh, where every component is, is modelled, um, the material properties are given, uh, the, uh, the impact of the car to follow uh, Euro NCAP rules uh, hits the pole at around about uh, 50 kilometres an hour, 14 metres a second. And um, we can pose a question, you know, what happens at the foundation down there? Um, this, uh, this is a beautiful uh, e example of, um, uh, of a vehicle restraint system. When you go to the, if, I'm, if I can be rude a little bit about codes, I, I will concentrate very much on the bridge code in the UK. If you go to the vehicle restraint part of the uh, bridge code these days, um, basically it gives handy guidance which says, oh, if your um, vehicle restraint barrier support post is close to the edge of a uh, slope, uh, then go talk to a geotechnical engineer. Um, and so really this talk is about what that geotechnical engineer may may do with that question about dealing with the uh, energy dissipation from a car impacting a vehicle restraint barrier. At the moment, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the guidance requires you to do dynamic analysis and field tests and so on and so forth. Um, the old rules of thumb uh, were, uh, re were removed in around about 2006. So uh, vehicle restraint barriers is... Uh, um, a, an area where we as geotechnical engineers need to be alive, and it's not uh, alive too. And, and it's not just um, uh, cars, uh, trains can leave the track and they can uh, uh, become small project or large projectiles, and we need to keep them on the straight and narrow. So, um, this, as I say, is a dynamic analysis. Uh, we need to be able to provide answers to what happens at the foundation system. Um, I, before I go into detail with numerical analysis aspects, I wanted to pay homage to those who have produced wonderful guidance uh, of uh, pseudo-static and use of simplified methods. In particular, a recent uh, um, uh, presentation by Ricardo Dobri uh, in the 21st Nabo Carrillo lecture. Um, a, a wonderful piece of uh, consolidate, consolidation of, uh, of knowledge. Um, in this uh, handy slide, uh, he does... Uh, show a gap forming underneath the, uh, uh, the foundation system. Um, the existence of a gap or no gap is very important uh, in our foundation system for Mexico City Airport, and I'll uh, uh, be talking about that uh, uh, later on. Um, so numerical analysis, this is the sort of stuff that we're, um, we're talking about, uh, where you have a tall building, next to a, a multi-propped uh, excavation where things uh, settle down slowly. You've got a static stage and then you've got a shaking phase. You've got different strain rates going on uh, throughout the, the mass of the soil. Um, uh, this is a scaled uh, one in a hundred year event for a tall building next to a, uh, a four level uh, propped uh, excavation uh, to show how uh, the two are, are intimately linked. So if you've got more than one tower next to your excavation, as we had on the Transbay Transit Centre, uh, then things can get quite interesting when you're trying to uh, design for earthquakes, not only in the permanent condition, but also in the temporary uh, condition, where um, a return period of around about 1 in 50 or 1 in 100 years might be uh, uh, important. Uh, so pseudo-static uh, analysis cannot do this uh, uh, adequately. Uh, so we're uh, effectively forced into 3D uh, analysis. Um, we, um, Ibi Al Mufti and I, set out the, uh, the the basic minimum requirements for numerical analysis in a paper that we published in uh, uh, proceedings uh, a couple of years back. And basically, we need uh, pressure and rate sensitive nonlinear stress strain soil properties. We need degrading G over G max curve for the soil. The water pressures have to rec recognize volumetric and shear strain rates, uh, at both at excavation and construction, and then at dynamic excitation stages, uh, as well as post construction stages. The foundation systems have to be modeled accurately. Uh, we need interface layers between those structural elements and the soil mass that represent disturbed soils. Uh, we need to represent structures, vehicles, and so on uh, with the right massing, 
stiffness and damping to capture that dynamic behavior. Uh, we need to uh, represent the construction installation sequencing properly, and so that it does capture the basic uh, geometry of what we have. Uh, we need the soil domain to be sufficiently large that boundary effects are negligible during the dynamic loading, and we should be able to provide what uh, my colleague Kirk Ellison calls, it, calls the rupture to rafters process for the seismic load case. So you go from the, the fissure in the, uh, in the ground up to the, the top of the building as it shakes, and you're able to provide a, uh, um, a seamless story numerically between the uh, propagation of the earthquake uh, right up to the way in which the, uh, uh, the structure works and responds. Um, this particular example, um, which I showed uh, dynamically in the video, uh, produced the, uh, the interesting uh, result that during the um, temporary excavation condi condition, the lowest prop in the excavation, around about uh, 400 units, would effectively double during this uh, quite minor earthquake, one in 100 years. Uh, due to the proximity of this uh, relatively shallow foundation uh, system from a tall building. So that sort of an effect is rather um, un, uh, unexpected and uh, it's certainly not, uh, something that you cannot get from, uh, from uh, pseudo-static analysis. We are addressing, in effect, performance-based design uh, and what I, would, uh, what I like to call the repairable limit state uh, I borrowed the phrase from uh, uh, a, a great paper published in uh, uh, Souls and Foundations by Honjo back in uh, 2010, where he identified the, the, a distinction between ultimate limit state design, where you stop things collapsing and uh, uh, extreme loss of life, uh, where, as I've shown in this SEOC uh, diagram on the, uh, the left-hand side, that's a totally unacceptable situation. Uh, there is a sort of a middle performance zone here where we're into a, uh, um, an operational stage. It's, uh, the building after the extreme event can work. A um, certain amount of repair is, uh, is needed. So this enables us to uh, not build buildings which are super over-designed or, or whatever, but the right level of design for the category of extreme event that uh, we have chosen uh, as the, um, uh, as the uh, governing load case. So we're after the repairable limit state. We want to discover displacements, the forces that, uh, uh, that the buildings will uh, experience and the amount of ductility that the, uh, the buildings and so on uh, need to have to, uh, to deal with those, uh, those events with whatever uh, frequency we've chosen in our uh, hazard and uh, risk assessment. Now, the basic building blocks in all of this is uh, uh, the um, backbone curve. And I've used John Atkinson's um, excellent ranking lecture from uh, uh, alarmingly large number of years ago. Uh, but um, this is uh, the, uh, the classical secant uh, G over G max uh, decay curve. And we can see here that um, uh, the, the shape of this curve, although it, 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 it was just one line in, in, in uh, one S curve in, in John's, um, uh, John's paper, uh, this, this line can exist anywhere, more or less, between the, the extremities of the arrows that I've shown there. And uh, basically the, the curve moves upwards and to the right with extreme, ex increasing strain rate, increase, increasing plasticity index, PI, and increasing over consolidation ratio, and the opposite is true uh, in the other direction, down to um, sands and uh, uh, silts. Um, at the bottom there is um, the uh, um, reference to lab testing. Now dynamic methods uh, involve extremely high s strain rates as opposed to conventional soil testing, let's say the triaxial test, which are classically carried out at three or four times slower strain rate um, so we should not expect um, we should not expect the um, uh, the strain rate at which we're testing to produce a nice smooth curve, and we do need to adjust uh, curves for those strain rates which were established by those uh, different tests. Uh, the um, uh, shape of the curve can be uh, 
described by, by these, uh, this sort of um, governing equation. Um, if we plot this in uh, um, shear stress and strain, shear strain space, you can see the, the dashed dark line, the monotonic backbone curve uh, there, which uh, describes um, the way most soils deform. And we can see uh, the elliptical shape of an unload, uh, reload um, curve uh, following more or less uh, Mazing's uh, rule. Um, in praise of uh, shear modulus, I want to um, go through some of the basic uh, relationships. So we start with G max, which is a function of shear wave velocity uh, and uh, unit weight of soil. Um, we can also establish G max from uh, empirical relationships such as this one. Uh, we know how the, uh, the monotonic backbone curve decays and can be described. Um, and for isotropic materials, we can say that um, uh, we can relate it to Young's modulus through um, Poisson's ratio. And so if the soil is completely undrained, we have um, an undrained Young's modulus of about 3G and uh, uh, reducing to uh, 2.4G uh, with a Poisson's ratio of 0.2 and the soil is fully drained. And we can think about, we can imagine intermediate situations between fully drained and uh, completely undrained. In order to uh, make the point about uh, expectation from lab testing, um, I have gone rather unfairly to uh, Giorgiano's um, data on Valerica clay that was then reported in uh, um, Paul Main uh, and, and, and others' excellent uh, um, keynote paper at a, a soil mechanics conference a few years back, uh, where Coincidentally, the resonant column testing, which is done at, frequent, uh, at shear strain rates uh, of around about 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 3 strain rates per second, uh, and they more or less coincide with uh, the triaxial tests, um, uh, which, uh, tests that was carried out at uh, a strain rate of around about 10 to the minus 6 strain units per second. Uh, this has never happened to me uh, with... Um, uh, uh, soils that I've been dealing with. There's always a, uh, a difference and there's not a happy uh, uh, shape like that. Uh, also, we need to concentrate at this end of the uh, uh, G over G max curve and um, uh, get the right strength uh, of the material uh, so that we can make sure that the right amount of uh, uh, kinematic energy of the soil and its resistance, uh, the correct amount of resistance is mobilized. So. Uh, in the past, we've tended to obsess about small strain stiffness and so on and so forth. We also need to look at the highly rate-dependent end of the, uh, uh, the S-curve down there. And if we find um, a relationship in, in a solid line here from uh, classic work by Darren Deli, um, uh, we find that in order to uh, go from Darren Deli's curves, which are more or less... Uh, uh, derived at a shear strain rate of about 10 to the minus 3 strain units per second, we have to sort of slow it down a bit if we're looking at situations which are going at around about 10 to the minus 6. Uh, and then if we look at the strength, as you can see in, in, on the right-hand side there, you have shear stress against shear strain. You can see that the strength, let's call it the undrained strength if we're in a clay, um, is very much higher at the higher uh, strain rate. And I would like to use um, two contrasting examples. On the right-hand side, uh, the vertical axis, uh, I've left it blank in the middle for a reason, uh, the vertical axis is indeed normalized undrained strength, um, that is the undrained strength divided by the uh, confining cell pressure in a uh, isotropically consolidated undrained strength. And, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, these, these are intact Me Mexico City clays with a PI of 200%. Um, you can see with the strain rates uh, shown there that uh, um, if we are in material which has not been destroyed in the triaxial cell, and there is a, uh, um, or there was, uh, a, a tendency in some uh, Mexico City labs to over consolidate, go well beyond the yield stress of the material, this tricky diatomaceous uh, high PI uh, soil, um, 
and that produced a very low strain rate behavior. But if you treat the samples properly, then you find what uh, uh, Professor Diaz Rodriguez uh, Martinez and, uh, and Carlos Santa Marina found, uh, and you can see that strain rates up to even 20% can occur um, in, uh, in some situations, where you, in particular where you have high diatom content. So if we compare then that with uh, the other end of the scale, resedimented intrinsic uh, behavior of uh, Boston blue clay with a PI down at uh, 24%, we find that uh, the strain rate is typically around about 5% per log, uh, uh, log cycle of shear strain rate. So we have now a uh, possibility of shifting that uh, G over G max curve in proportion to shear strain rate. And fortunately, uh, the adjustment of G over G max, things that we had been doing, I have to say, within uh, our part of Arup for a while, have been given academic legitimacy by Paul Vardeniger and Malcolm Bolton in, a, in an excellent paper in the, uh, the ASC um, back in 2013, where they uh, uh, produced this uh, uh, adjustment number Z um, for strain rate. So uh, here, this uh, particularly, uh, we have a 5% adjustment rate here uh, for a resonant column uh, test result, which is resonating at 50 hertz. And that then uh, introduces these numbers in the equation. Um, uh, now, um, Kishida at Berkeley has been reviewing a wide range of um, uh, the shapes of these uh, uh, backbone curves. And he's more or less agreeing with, uh, with uh, Paul Vardeniger and uh, Malcolm Bolton. So the way forward is exactly that, to adjust the uh, G over G max curve for strain rate. And here uh, we have the um, situation for San Francisco Old Bay Clay uh, with a plasticity index of uh, uh, around about 40 to 50% and an at an OCR of one, where the blue line shows what we might call a static shear, shear stiffness. That would apply in slow... Uh, let's say, excavation stage type loading to the, uh, the red line, which would be appropriate in uh, seismic shaking. If we go to Mexico City, and that cross, that red cross, is at the same place in, in the G over G max uh, shear strain space. So you can see for the high PI, we're shifting that G over G max curve to the right. And um, uh, if we compare it with... Um, work by Gonzalez and Romo on, on intact, intact Mexico City clays, and they got a, a, a G over G max of about 0.1 at 10% shear strain. Um, that was uh, at triaxial strain rates. We have to adjust that up to the solid black line uh, to allow for, um, um, if you like, monotonic rate effects. And then under cyclic loading, we have to then pull down that, uh, that end of the... Uh, um, G over G max curve for the uh, extreme effects of uh, cyclic degradation and destructuration uh, that occurs in, in those uh, difficult soils. Uh, and then we have to adjust the hysteretic damping and uh, essentially we have to go from mazing to non-mazing uh, formulae. Now just a little bit about hysteretic damping uh, or unload reload loops. Uh, these are more or less proportional in some way to the secant uh, uh, shear uh, modulus um, curve itself, the, uh, the backbone curve. And hysteretic damping is more or less uh, the ratio of the energy dissipated during an unload-reload loop uh, divided by the energy retained. So basically the green area divided by f uh, 4 pi times the triangular area. Um, and this goes back to uh, uh, Mazing's paper uh, in German in 1926. Um, so if we uh, find destructuration, liquefaction, shift of 0.0, uh, 0 or 0 on this uh, diagram uh, for any reason, then we're into non-mazing modelling and our numerical model has to allow for those uh, um, uh, changes in damping. Um, there is a, a general tendency for mazing-based formulations to over, overestimate hysteretic damping. Uh, and so it's very important to calibrate against lab tests, uh, especially to include cyclic degradation effects and destructuration. Uh, recent work by Zhang, uh, assuming mazing rules, has, has shown that uh, one can 
uh, establish from the shape of the G of Gmax curve what one would expect the hysteretic damping uh, um, ratio to look like, but it's always best because of the scatter um, uh, to carry out uh, decent cyclic testing and get it more or less right. Um, before we go any, any further, uh, because I'll be looking at wave loading and train loading and so on, soil resistance to dynamic or short-term loading, um, drained or undrained, zero volumetric strain or somewhere in between. Now geometry is important and I've gone back to um, uh, my, my mentor uh, Bob Gibson uh, in, a, in a wonderful paper published uh, with uh, 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 Bob Schiffman and Poole uh, back in 1970 and basically geometry is important so we can say that uh, things are in an engineering sense, a geotechnical engineering sense essentially undrained if that time factor um, two times shear modulus at the current at whatever state we're in uh, permeability at whatever state we're in divided by um, uh, sorry times time uh, divided by gamma w and at some length width of loading and the distance to the drainage boundary is always greater than 0.5 you know you can go go to the paper and see what the constraints are uh, but basically if it's less than 10 to the minus 2 uh, then the material is basically drained. And so when we look at plausible combinations of these uh, variables, uh, we can see that um, undrained behavior can be assumed if for uh, high permeability materials, cohesion the sand-like soils with an uh, expectation of a certain value of G, experience a rate of loading or unloading uh, less than one second. And they're not particularly strain rate sensitive when the rate of shearing is greater than 10 to the minus five strain units per second. So there is obviously uh, creep effects at, at slower rates of uh, testing, which I will not go into this evening. And uh, at uh, um, permeability is less than 10 to the minus 9, cohesive clay-like soils experience a rate of loading um, uh, and can be considered to be effectively undrained at less than 10 days. Uh, however, these materials are dynamically, as we've seen, highly strain rate sensitive, particularly at low OCR and high PI. Uh, so this means, for the, as we're in London, that if you're excavating in London clay, then uh, uh, the assumption that your excavation is undrained uh, after 10 days or, uh, or so uh, is a proxy of real life. And you have to uh, think about drainage, uh, even in London clay situations, when, when looking at real behaviour of excavation. So I'll, I'll finish that one there. Um, uh, at uh, University of Newcastle, New South Wales, um, recent work by Sheng and, and looking at uh, varying rates of CPT numerically uh, using a modified Cantlay um, formulation with coupled excess pore pressures and permeability with varying penetration rates from uh, 200 centimetres a second to very slow has shown this quite useful relationship between pore pressure generation and uh, normalize, uh, velocity normalised by permeability. And this sort of helps us understand, I think, and we can start to use the CPT to, um, in a more creative way, to uh, model uh, dynamically what's going on in a, in a CPT test. Um, at the bottom left-hand side, you can see a CPT being pushed very elegantly and slowly into uh, a, um, in this case, a... Um, uh, elastic, perfectly plastic uh, um, material with those properties along the top there. Uh, but if we do it at different rates, we can see that the inertial effect of shoving those elements out the way of the cone uh, produces its own rate effect. And uh, I think this is, this is an important area, which I will go into more detail in the, in the paper, where we start to look at uh, the creative use of these in situ tests in dynamic uh, analysis so that we, because at the end of the day this is an extreme event for these soils and uh, we can examine strain rate very closely now uh, with these um, uh, uh, powerful um, uh, computer programs. And here we have uh, a complete model of um, a, a CPT uh, carried out in Mexico City clays uh, with and without strain rate with destructuration and at variable ver uh, velocity. And what we find is that, uh, sure enough, 
uh, the best fit with the CPT behavior is found in this blue line where we have um, a strain rate effect of about 15% per log cycle um, and um, with destructuration uh, allowed for as well within the, within the model. Um, we've uh, checked other people's models and we find quite uh, a good parity with uh, uh, work on uh, rate effect work on uh, um, uh, Boston blue clay. Uh, sorry, no strain rate effect on Boston blue clay, but the analysis of CPTs. And uh, so, in, in conclusion for this bit, uh, there's a lot we can do with in situ tests and uh, with lab tests to discover more about strain rate effects so that we can better characterize the materials in terms of that uh, uh, backbone curve for, um, uh, for analysis. Now to go into uh, examples, um, Olivier mentioned the, uh, the Hau train project, uh, this uh, new railway between Johannesburg and Pretoria. Uh, there, are, there is uh, lengths on ballasted track on slab, there are also long lengths of uh, viaducts and many dozens of uh, viaduct piers. However, the alignment of the, um, of the railway went through uh, sinkhole-prone um, areas. This was a new railway for the Soccer World Cup in 2010. And um, uh, basically, um, it was in uh, a, a known area of uh, dolomite residuum or WOD um, that this railway line alignment had been chosen. Uh, conventional uh, ground investigation technique in the area is air flush rotary and measurement of drilling rate. So basically, you do the investigation and you get a heap of sand of varying colour uh, at, uh, at the top and you're told what the drilling rate is. And uh, you have to design a foundation system on the basis of that. Um, there's limited published soils data, but there was a good history of sinkhole occurrence. So uh, we were able to look at the incidence of um, sinkholes, what their radius could be and where they might occur in space. Um, the viaduct foundations were typically uh, four pile, uh, groups of four piles, and um, uh, the uh, uh, end of the piles was uh, into a good quality uh, dolomite, uh, or uh, wad that wasn't going to, or dolomite that was not going, that was stable below the water table. Triple pass grouting was used at the base of these piles to make sure that there was a zone at least uh, within, this is a planned view of a four pile foundation, uh, where um, if a sinkhole occurred within those, uh, those sort of loopy uh, areas, it would not uh, cause uh, an unacceptable rotation of the viaduct and cause uh, derailment. However, there was a potential, we identified through uh, quantified risk assessment processes, of a sinkhole occurring off centre uh, at, at some distance away from the four pile group. And it was that scenario that we wanted to home in on and look at uh, whether the foundation could be uh, um, uh, resilient enough to, uh, to take that uh, extreme event. Uh, we established that um, a characteristic sinkhole uh, of 15 metres in diameter was the one to go for. That was the right, uh, um, that, that uh, fitted with the history of um, sinkhole uh, occurrence in the, in the area. Um, we were able to persuade the, GR, the, the ground investigation contractors to use uh, a Maynard pressure meter. Um, and there were French operators available to operate the, uh, the pressure meter, um, indeed. And um, we had some excellent results from that, and we were able to model it uh, perfectly adequately, uh, dynamically, uh, the whole formation, the placement of the uh, pressure meter with its guard cells, uh, the application of pressure at a certain rate, and so on and so forth. And we were able to get um, from multiple pressure meter tests the... Uh, um, the, the Young's modulus uh, variation uh, with depth. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that Bagalan was right. Um, the uh, drained Young's modulus was roughly uh, two and a half times the pressure meter modulus. And um, we were able to show that within reasonable bounds uh, throughout the test duration, um, 
that we could model this, uh, this soil in, um, in a 3D uh, um, formulation. We can see here that uh, we got a good fit with tests at uh, shallow depth, 1.2 meters, and uh, 10 times that depth, uh, perfectly adequate for, uh, for modeling this event. Uh, and establishing these properties enabled, we, enabled us to, uh, uh, to model collapse events and see whether we were more or less right with the uh, shapes and uh, occurrence of these uh, sinkholes. So yes, we were able to, to model a uh, sinkhole in, uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere and uh, also uh, at the, uh, the viaduct foundation location. Um, I'll just fire up this... Uh, this video. So here you can see the collapse occurring and the soil flowing past half of the foundation. This is an axisymmetric slice through the, um, through the analysis, through the pile group. We can use the analysis to plot the lateral pressures and we find that, uh, um, that nowhere does the uh, lateral stress exceed uh, a number roughly twice the uh, active thrust. And the reason why the, uh, the thrust is so much lower than we anticipated, this was a surprising result to us, uh, was that the sort of horizontal arches that you see forming in uh, some uh, laterally loaded pile tests and pile group tests, these horizontal arches are not allowed to form when the soil is actually failing. And so um, we were able to take advantage of this uh, finding of the numerical analysis and... Um, adequately reinforce those uh, uh, piles against um, sinkhole collapse. Uh, we're plotting here the, um, uh, the, li the uh, lines of lateral stress at increasing times through the collapse event. Um, this was an unexpected result and uh, it helped us educate, if you will, our hand calculations in this case. So that's uh, an extreme event, a sinkhole collapse. Now moving into more repetitive situations and wave loading, um, offshore structures getting deeper and deeper. Uh, Milt Anderson uh, has produced these well-known plots of uh, excess pore pressure generation below gravity-based type structures, uh, which uh, describe the way in which uh, excess pore pressure is generated in the foundation. I'm particularly in interested at this stage at looking at uh, the... Uh, behavior of foundations on medium dense to dense sands. Uh, here we have a, uh, uh, again, a, a, a structure on dense sands. Uh, I'll get this uh, video fired up again, where this is a, a, a one in 10,000 storm event where we can see in plan where these high uh, excess pore pressure areas are. Um, through the, uh, through the progress of the storm. Now, the design storm, um, historically, um, is taken from um, uh, paper recommendations from uh, Hanstein back in 1980. And so the storm <coughs> regime looks a little bit like this. This is a sort of a fatigue loading type uh, diagram where you've got 900 lesser waves and one very big wave. Uh, right at the end of the storm. Uh, the average wave period is 12 seconds. So in a dense sand, 12 seconds is actually quite a long time and we can allow some drainage to occur if we can think about the way in which these, uh, these waves are landing on the, uh, uh, the structure. Um, at the time we were, we were designing um, the Ravensburn gravity platform, um, uh, uh, <coughs> A wonderful applied mathematician, Michael Longjoy Higgins, had been looking hard his, his entire career at the statistics of storms and found basically um, the probability of waves looking like the Hanstein wave, uh, get, get it, with waves getting bigger and bigger and bigger, was negligible. It would never, a, a storm would not look like that. And in fact, uh, by, by the use of um, uh, uh, statistical analysis, um, we were able to use Longway Higgins' work to effectively break up a storm into packets of 12 waves at a time and to effectively randomise uh, the wave population, um, pseudo-random, because we reordered the, uh, the waves um, 
and, uh, to produce a more realistic storm uh, composition. And because we can break up the waves into, into this way, when we're in a dense sand situation, uh, which, um, in which uh, repetitive cyclic loads are causing increasing excess pore pressure, if we can allow drainage to occur um, during the, uh, the wave, the storm environment, then we can greatly reduce the amount of uh, excess pore pressure that could be generated in the uh, foundation system and reduce the on-bottom weight uh, or, or the other parts of the structures that rely on support from these um, medium dense to dense sands at, uh, at, at shallow depth. And um, I, I'm just going to take you through a very short uh, example here where we're using, there are many ways of describing uh, the way in which excess pore pressure is generated in uh, uh, various loading scenarios, but uh, in um, DSS, in simple shear, um, I'm going to use this expression here, where tor is the uh, cyclic shear stress, sigma v naught is the, uh, the static uh, uh, vertical effective stress, and uh, beta is an expression of the incremental excess pore pressure that's generated in a cycle. And if we compare that to um, um, work done at uh, UC Davis on PM4 sand, we can see that that, uh, uh, that expression, beta, a beta expression plots more or less at a relative density of about 60% um, in uh, uh, PM4 sand uh, cyclic stress ratio against number of uniform cycles to liquefaction. Um, when we use uh, statistics, we run the, uh, the Monte Carlo simulations and so on and so forth, we find quite a tightly banded excess pore pressure generation uh, from this uh, um, uh, way of treating a storm uh, and uh, we, we are continuing to be asked to design uh, and, and see built large offshore structures. Uh, we have used this uh, simulation, RAN Wave, which uh, I published with John Seaman and Barry Lahan had a hand, hand in it in those days. Um, we've loaded it now to a variety of platforms, Safe, Plaxis, and LS Dyna. Uh, and uh, we're now, now able to analyze those, those things pretty accurately. To show the effect of assuming dissipation from a pseudo-random storm composition, this is a plot of the end, end of storm um, ratio of excess pore pressure to um, vertical effective stress, where one indicates liquefaction. And if we had the Hanstein storm under the, uh, the base of the uh, offshore structure with no dissipation, then it would have liquefied at, if we were at the maximum shear stress ratio of about 0.3 in this particular example, a one in a hundred year uh, return period. Um, if we had chosen to use the um, uh, Hanstein storm with dissipation, vertical drainage in effect to uh, the, uh, the drainage system, under the structure, uh, then we'd be down at this particular line. But with the um, random wave process that I've uh, shown there, uh, we end up with um, nearly a halving of the excess pore pressure. And this has a huge effect on uh, construction and installation time and money. So rather than concentrating on Complex, the complexity of what happens to medium dense and dense sands as they approach liquefaction, um, greater effort, there is benefit in applying greater effort to the loading environment um, that, we, that we have an experience. Now, uh, Jason de Jong uh, at UC Davis has been doing some very interesting uh, experiments in the centrifuge there uh, with earthquake loading and drainage in between earthquakes and he is finding uh, increasing resistance uh, from successive earthquakes, uh, pre-shearing in effect, uh, and increasing density uh, from um, the soil, in this case uh, Ottawa sand, which started off at 25% and ended at about 80% after shaking. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a, a, a good quality um, uh, sand constitutive model that could uh, do that sort of stuff? So, 
we've moved from waves now to dynamic analysis uh, with high-speed train loading. Um, here is uh, a, a very old video now uh, of the Eurostar going across the Thames Marsh Pass Slab in virtual space. Effectively, trackbed um, undergoes thousands of microseismic events uh, per day. And um, it is the behavior, the repetitive loading of these um, uh, granular, essentially granular support systems, which uh, can be a challenge. We effectively have an 18th century technology for 21st century railways. Uh, but in order to try to explain how um, ballast uh, works, uh, we are starting to see really big strides in uh, discrete element modelling. And uh, this is uh, an example of work by, by John Hark Harkness at Southampton University, and similar strides are being made at Nottingham uh, by Glenn McDowell. And here we see on the uh, left-hand side the coloured, uh, colourful diagram, uh, a simulation of ballast uh, in discrete elements with a certain, uh, that have these characteristics in terms of sieve size and angularity and so on. And uh, they have been attempting to mimic those lab tests in, uh, in, in scale triaxial cells. And they find uh, considerable, uh, finding considerable success in damage dependent strain um, modeling. I won't go into detail uh, with all of this, but suffice it to say that uh, uh, the best fit uh, between the laboratory and the simulation uh, was found when there was a decent modelling of crushing of the particle uh, to particle contact and the uh, sliding uh, resistance uh, and breakage of the asperities that uh, are a part of this uh, complex interplay uh, between ballast particles. Fortunately, after a few thousand cycles, we get to a resilient modulus for the ballast and we're able to uh, um, model quite complicated um, uh, uh, systems of uh, uh, sleepers and embankments and uh, geotextiles and uh, control modulus columns and so on uh, under various uh, train loading environments. And typically we can uh, estimate what the displacement under load is going to be. Now, uh, Southampton University has been pioneering uh, this, uh, this particular work of examining in fine detail the real behavior of uh, sleeper-based systems on ballasted track. And uh, this next slide is taken from work by Darren Bonus, um, where they were looking at video and geophone uh, data on uh, particular sleepers at Ashford. Um, followed uh, work also uh, followed from... Um, uh, Priest and Powery um, on uh, the high-speed line at Ashford where they showed that uh, the stiffness even of, of nearby sleepers varied by a factor of three. Very difficult uh, uh, to deal with this sort of variability um, uh, from a design point of view. Everyone's built, trying to build a perfect railway but it's actually practically very difficult when you're dealing with uh, highly angular uh, ballast-like material. Um, recent paper by, uh, by, by Milne uh, looking at um, uh, a well-known high-speed line in the UK uh, at the behaviour at, at um, places where high maintenance was needed uh, found that one of the uh, highest maintenance areas with a displacement of six millimetres there or thereabouts with the passage of a, a high-speed train was in fact on a structure um, where this particular structural detail had been used and the sleeper had coincided with the ballast. Um, fortunately, I'm pleased to uh, learn that uh, HS2 is not going for ballasted track, but is going for slab track, where things are much easier. The challenges are different, but uh, at least we are not dealing with uh, the intricacies of granular uh, fabric behavior um, under repetitive loading. Now, rising train speeds, um, uh, in particularly those on ballasted tracks on, uh, on effectively old lines, uh, can be a challenge. And this, uh, this plot uh, shows uh, the ratio of dynamic to static displacement 
uh, at, at three locations. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on, on Ledsgard in, in Sweden, where um, they measured uh, something like uh, 12 to 15 millimetres of, uh, of track displacement as the train speed uh, came up to the, uh, the, the designed line speed of 200 kilometres an hour. Um, what happened at Ledsgard, also at, at Stilton Fen here in the UK on the East Coast Main Line, is that the rally wave was coinciding with the, uh, um, the bending wave at speed of the um, track sleeper uh, ballast system, and you were getting resonance in effect. Now, um, this diagram shows the different P wave, S wave, and surface waves. Um, and their relationship with Poisson's ratio. So fortunately for us, as in, um, enthusiasts for shear wave velocity, the rally wave is virtually the same as the uh, shear wave. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, we can say at uh, high Poisson's ratio, um, nearly undrained situations, we can say that the rally wave is more or less the same. Now this. Uh, uh, Diagram shows what happens as we, uh, as the bending wave um, velocity, given by that expression there, that bending wave velocity, uh, the train speed, and the ground um, uh, shear wave velocity coincide. Uh, we get a resonance not only of the track but also propagation of ground ball noise and so on and so forth. So this is a situation we want to keep well clear of. Um, we're able to model this quite simply, uh, at these lower train speeds um, using uh, linear elastic uh, soil representations. And here we see the, uh, uh, the um, results from Ladsgaard, Stilton, and so on, plotted against the green line, where the EI, the, uh, the, the bending stiffness of the ballast and the track and the rail system is found to be roughly 47 uh, meganewton meter squared, something like that. That sort of is a, is a good number that most people recognize in the railway industry. As you move to higher train speed, though, you have to go non-linear. It is possible to simulate in a linear elastic model, um, and I've shown here the, the, the fudges that are needed to, to shoehorn uh, results uh, from a, a linear elastic 3D train loading model, uh, but um, basically um, this is a uh, predictable effect if the soil uh, is, is, uh, is weak enough. So in this next slide I, I've produced um, an unfactored, unfactored screening threshold for clay-like soil subgrades under high and very high speed transport systems. So we have shear wave velocity on the vertical axis and the undrained shear strength on the, uh, the horizontal. If we, uh, if we uh, are trying to build hyperloop uh, at uh, 1,000 uh, kilometers an hour, uh, then pretty much ev every kind of clay-like soil is going to be uh, potentially resonating. Uh, if we're down at more reasonable speeds of um, HS2 and HS1, uh, then uh, we're down at uh, the reasonable uh, static uh, shear strength range of about 20 to 50 kilopascals, something like that. And uh, the situation at Ledsgaard was very unusual, where, where they had material that had a, a strength of about uh, 10 kilopascals, and so it was almost certain, certainly going to cause resonance. And this is taken from a paper by Holm, uh, which shows the, uh, the very low shear wave velocity that existed on that site, and the equally very low shear strength uh, of, the, uh, of the soil at around about uh, 12, um, 12 kilopascals there or thereabouts. Um, I mentioned uh, slab track, and uh, we, were, uh, we were able to examine the benefits of uh, slab track uh, in uh, dynamic analysis. And this, this plot shows uh, the dynamic amplification in the green and red lines. Um, effectively with, a, with either no track bed or a ballasted uh, track bed with this uh, EI of about 47. So uh, we've got this uh, critical speed of around about 100 meters per second. But if we start to stiffen up the, the track and uh, an EI of 100 
2021 is about the lowest credible stiffness of a slab track system, um, then we can get a double peak effect but lower dynamic amplification. So basically, uh, these sort of uh, high velocity effects of resonance in track bed systems can be minimized by stiffer, better engineered track, track bed. Uh, let's call it slab track. Uh, there, is, there is one length of slab track in the UK and it's between Crewe and Kidsgrove and it's used as a sort of a slow line. But uh, again, Southampton have looked at the performance of that uh, um, slab and uh, it behaves quite well. Um, the top graph is of the adjacent ballasted track uh, the adjacent ballasted track settles uh, or moves a little bit less than the um, uh, slab track, but that's because this particular type of slab track has a particular type of rail support which is unusually um, flexible. But you can see that the rail noise, uh, th these sort of peaky, uh, noisy um, uh, vibrations are effectively smoothed out quite significantly by the... Uh, uh, the wheel rail interface on a, a well, well engineered uh, slab track. So, before I go into earthquakes, um, I've looked at soil collapse, large strain but monotonic loading, wave loading, structure and uh, soil response to that structural response uh, reaction to the wave loading, and again the application of train loads through structures and the soil response associated. If we move into the seismic arena, we've got a number of things to, uh, to take on board. There's site response analysis, which I'm not going to go into this evening at all. Um, but um, in fact, uh, I, I have a paper coming out in proceeding shortly uh, on this subject to do with site response analysis for um, soil structure interaction analysis. Um, I will talk a little bit about modal analysis and uh, then soil response and degrade, degradation of that soil response and uh, SSSI, uh, structure soil structure interaction, and a little bit about the rupture to rafters analytical process. Um, I started off um, uh, the talk uh, about Mexico City and how the uh, anthropogenic effect uh, of shaking from the city. Um, occurred, and I wanted to go into some detail there with, uh, with real data. Um, if we go from west to east across the lake bed in, in uh, uh, the Mexico basin, then we find this range of shear wave velocity profiles varying with depth. And um, this is to scale, and 200 meters per second shear wave velocity is shown there on the right hand side and all of these plots are more or less to scale and you can see as one goes further and further uh, east into the under, undeveloped uh, part of the lake bed so the uh, um, shear wave velocity gets lower and lower and the, uh, the crustal um, increase in shear wave velocity d disappears. This next video was taken on the 19th September last year on site uh, during our construction uh, at uh, Mexico City Airport. These are 20-ton trucks. Um, and um, uh, I've suppressed the, uh, the voice uh, <laughs> part of the, uh, of the video. But you can see these very large um, vehicles uh, sustaining roughly uh, um, 0.5 g at ground, ground surface. And uh, when we look at the data at, uh, and this data is, is generated by uh, our colleagues in, in, in UNAM, um, we see that the uh, acceleration trace associated with this event uh, was pretty much all over after about 100, uh, 100 seconds of shaking. And, uh, and the video itself sort of comes to a, a shuddering halt after about that uh, same duration. So when we look at other recording stations nearby, uh, in this case uh, the AUKS station, uh, in the urban fabric, and compare it to our undeveloped part of the lake bed, and we look back at what was then, in 2002, a speculative uh, piece of research by uh, Guiguan, um, 
looking at the urban effect on ground motions in Mexico City, he found that if the building to soil kinematic energy ratio um, was greater than about 0.1, having looked at the urbanization density, the building height uh, to soft soil thickness ratio, and the, uh, uh, the potential for resonance between the soil and the building, if that ratio was less than 0.1, uh, then there would be, uh, he reckoned, an urban effect from the, uh, uh, the, the built up area on these very soft deposits. And when we do the, uh, do the maths, uh, we find a ratio, building to soil kinematic energy ratio at the AUX station um, city block area, it's eight times the, uh, the threshold. And this um, enables us to put into context uh, the difference between shaking within the urban area, where we're busily designing buildings and seeing them built, uh, to this area out beyond the city limits and to draw distinction between the two. When we do the spectral analysis of what's going on at uh, this uh, AUK station in a, in a local school, um, we find that the motion is divided into two parts. Uh, we have the first 100 seconds or so, which is conventional earthquake um, sent from uh, Puebla, 100, uh, 150 kilometers away. Uh, but then there's a second phase from about 300 seconds or there or thereabouts where there's a steady beating at a period of about four or five seconds. This is the anthropogenic effect, we think. And if we look back at the uh, 1985 event at another urban station, um, we find exactly the same thing happening. There's a first stage and a second stage. Uh, so there is, I think, growing evidence of the way in which the way in which that we build the urban environment and the way in which that environment then is reacting to an extreme event like an earthquake, uh, the environment itself is adding to the, um, uh, the seismic loading of the, uh, of the city block. In more normal soils, um, in this case, San Francisco, uh, you know, we do have this uh, uh, proximity thing. So uh, whilst you have a large city block effect, a very, a very large urban effect in Mexico City on very soft soils, when you're in stiffer soils, it's the proximity of one tall thing, let's say, to one very deep thing that uh, uh, can have an effect. Uh, now, I was hoping to have enough time, but I don't have enough time to go through uh, seismic centrifuge tests, simulations of city blocks uh, effects, which have been uh, uh, explained and well covered uh, by, by these authors here. This, these are um, centrifuge tests carried out at UC Davis, uh, where um, on the right-hand side, high-rise structures are shaken, admittedly on dry Nevada sand, but you've got to start somewhere, uh, to look at the effects um, on adjacent tunnels nearby. And that is where the, the biggest uh, interaction effect um, is likely to occur, rather than shaking adjacent dissimilar height buildings. Um, back to San Francisco, and uh, this uh, next photo is taken looking down the axis of the Transbay Transit Center during construction from a building on the right-hand side, side, roughly where that yellow arrow is. And um, you can see uh, this 20-meter uh, deep excavation, braced four, four levels. Um, uh, these, this was taken, um, I don't know, three years ago, something like that. Uh, the situation now is uh, the building is nearly finished. This is, you know, after three or four years of construction. And we have 181 Fremont, the building on the right uh, in the photograph, and the building which is being shaken in a modal analysis on the left-hand side, adjacent to the deep excavation and the... Uh, uh, the Transbay superstructure that we see there, and the redwood forest is growing, um, really, as, as I speak, uh, across that um, uh, uh, roof space there. Um, when we look at the modal uh, analysis of um, tall buildings, uh, we need to understand how much mass participation is occurring so that we can uh, characterize uh, what part of the uh, acceleration spectrum is important. And uh, when we unpick 
uh, how this uh, very tall and quite complex externally braced structure is, is behaving. We find the first five modes are the ones where most of the, uh, uh, the mass particip participation is uh, occurring. When we look in plan at the Transbay Transit Center, this green, um, uh, deep uh, train box in, in the center of San Francisco, um, that itself has a uh, fundamental period of around about 1.2 seconds. Uh, 181 Fremont, uh, we can see, has 6.9 seconds uh, period. Uh, this is not a green field. All the other buildings have slightly different periods, uh, fixed, uh, fixed based periods in the first mode. And Salesforce Tower has an even higher period. So when, when these, this set of city blocks is shaken, um, the train box effectively acts as a deep beam and takes the load during shaking from all these various uh, um, tall buildings and their associated foundation systems. Uh, this next slide shows a um, psi response analysis, uh, one dimensional, uh, using a nonlinear uh, sole representation of the sequence uh, shown on the right hand side. Uh, with the shear wave velocity reassuringly high um, compared to Mexico City. Uh, and we can generate uh, the acceleration spectrum. We can look at the, uh, what would happen if uh, there were no buildings at all, the red line, the free field surface, uh, and we can examine uh, what's going on down at uh, the base mat level. Um, in terms of uh, creating a uh, 3D model of the city block, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, where we've got uh, towers around, we've got the foundation systems, the uh, 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 excavation is, is modeled. Uh, we have uh, all of the uh, main buildings surrounding this uh, uh, deep excavation. And we're able to examine what's going on during this uh, extreme event. This is a one in 975 return uh, earthquake in this particular case. When we unpick the results, uh, with just Salesforce Tower, this very tall tower, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the red lines are showing the, uh, uh, the force developed in the ground level slab um, without the uh, Salesforce Tower uh, in place. With the Salesforce Tower in, in place, you can see that this, uh, uh, the inertial effect from the tower and its uh, response from the foundation system under shaking is producing this, uh, uh, this bending effect. And when we add uh, 181 Fremont on the other side of the station box, the picture becomes even more complicated. And we can go down the building and uh, examine what's going on in the ground slab, the train box me mezzanine, and the base slab. Now, in terms of instrumenting the Anthropocene, uh, we instrumented the uh, Transbay Regeneration Zone with over 2,000 sensors uh, during uh, excavation. Um, we produced uh, you know, cloud-based systems so anyone, any neighbor, um, neighboring property could find out what was going on during construction in terms of movements and prop loads and all the rest of it. Uh, and. Um, during uh, construction, there was in fact an earthquake, um, the Napa earthquake in August uh, 2014. And this is a, um, a, um, an interference uh, photo um, image uh, produced by um, European Space Agency, Sentinel-1, um, which has enabled a definition of how much movement occurred in that uh, earthquake along the, uh, the rupture zone under Napa. Uh, which is about 60 kilometers away from downtown San Francisco. This was quite a, a low-grade, small earthquake for the region, a uh, magnitude of about six. Um, the um, uh, use of um, uh, uh, satellite imagery here produced uh, an estimate of around about two centimeters of slip along the, um, along the fault. So two centimeters of movement. Um, we were able to get from the records which are required of every significant building in, uh, uh, in the San Francisco city area these days, uh, they have to be equipped with accelerometers 
all the way down the building, down into the basements, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's uh, managed by the uh, California Geological Survey. And so during this event, we could see how the building and its uh, basement areas, down to the fifth basement, was behaving adjacent to our excavation. And at the same time, we were monitoring uh, automatically uh, the prop loads all the way down uh, the, the, uh, the various levels of the excavation. And the fourth level struck. This is what was going on at the time. And if we do a blow up on August the 21st at 3 a.m., there was a tiny blip. Uh, but nevertheless, we were reassured that it was just a tiny blip and it was compatible with what uh, the um, publicly available records were for the, um, uh, the basement in the adjacent building. The behaviour of structures during earthquakes and uh, the ability to model the behaviour of those real structures in earthquakes is, is a very rare um, possibility. But we are lucky in, uh, in Mexico City to have an example at the um, rather unlikely location of um, Impulsora Metro Station in the urban area uh, of a really good case history from the late uh, 1990s. And that has enabled us to confidently go forward with the design of the new airport, which I will finish on shortly. So this is a, a photo of the Impulsora Metro Station overbridge um, it's difficult to convey exactly the environment that one's, one finds oneself at Impulsora Metro Station, but this was about the best photo that we could get in terms of uh, an image. Uh, it's basically um, um, a, uh, a structure built on a three metre deep uh, voided raft founded on 77 piles which are terminated just above the first hard layer um, that one finds in Mexico City. So there's enough room here for regional subsidence to occur. And uh, I did omit actually in an earlier slide to just draw attention to the fact that we're in a, a situation where uh, the settlement, uh, this is again is a, a, a Sentinel-1 uh, radar survey, sorry, uh, where settlement is occurring in the uh, urban area over here at around about two and a half centimetres a month. Um, on our site, it's currently around about 1.5 centimetres a month. So there's a lot of substance going on. There's also a bit of bradyseismo going on in the volcanic areas here where the ground is going up a little bit. So it's important to make sure that the foundation system has enough space to settle a little bit without hitting that first hard layer and emerging out of the ground. So we had this uh, excellent case history, uh, which showed during this earthquake in uh, January 1997, the loads in the piles which were monitored and the contact uh, surface between the, the open raft-like uh, structure on which the bridge piers were founded. Uh, the loads in the piles went down during the earthquake and the interface stresses between the, par the, the mat and the soil went up a little bit. So there was load shedding from the piles. They were in intimate contact. There wasn't a gap. And uh, the system effectively um, regulated itself. Very interesting case history. And we, uh, this is by um, Jesus uh, Mendoza uh, and others uh, and dates from uh, the, uh, the late 90s. Uh, with the results eventually published in uh, Souls and Foundations in 2000. Um, the ground conditions at Impulsora uh, are shown here in terms of shear wave velocity versus depth and uh, cone resistance versus depth. And we can get back at some kind of uh, undra static undrained strength profile, which is around about 10 plus uh, 1 times the depth as you go down. So it reaches a healthy um, 30 kilopascals at about... Um, uh, 30 metres depth, something like that. Um, we've been able to model the structure fairly well, although the structural details are fairly sketchy and we rely only on the, uh, uh, the published paper. Um, Yunnan and Professor Mendoza do not have the original uh, design calculation, so we're having to guess kind of how this thing worked. Um, we have to model the piles 
very closely, and I'm just going to do a small digression, we need force transfer springs at the pile soil interface that properly behave during loading so that we don't artificially stiffen up the system and we do get proper uh, behavior, not only monotonically but under cyclic uh, and repetitive loads. Um, we were able to model, this was an excellent case history, it showed how force and uh, pressure developed under the mat and on piles throughout the construction process. Uh, we were able to model pretty accurately the way in which piles attracted load and the way in which the interface uh, stresses were distributed. Then for the January 11, 1997 event, we were able to uh, take records from a vertical array uh, at uh, this particular recording station, and that enabled us to scale properly the input motion into the, um, into the um, uh, foundation system so that we could uh, uh, more accurately uh, generate the um, response of the structure to shaking there. So if we go to the time history of load at the pile head, we can see indeed that during this particular event, some piles gained a little bit of load, uh, other piles lost quite a lot of load. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the piles where the um, load cells didn't work uh, lost quite a lot of load indeed. Uh, where we were able to um, match at uh, pile P4, um, the uh, performance of what we were anticipating and what the piles actually did there, uh, we found a reasonably good fit. I wouldn't say it was perfect, but uh, given that we had no structural calculations for that box thing, we probably um, slightly overestimated the stiffness of the box. But nevertheless, it was able to show that uh, the basic principle of... Um, loss of load in the piles during shaking and the transfer to the uh, pile soil interface was a mechanism that um, uh, was viable and that enabled us to go ahead boldly and design the uh, um, buildings for the new international uh, airport on the uh, Lake Texcoco, on Virgin Lake Texcoco clays. Uh, this next slide um, is... Um, designed mostly for architects, I have to say. But uh, anyway, it shows the principles of compensated foundations. <laughs> and uh, you know, here we have, here we have uh, uh, in Mexico, uh, Lake Texcoco clays, we have 200% uh, water content <laughs> clays. Uh, it's, it, it's got a shear strength, static shear strength of about 10 to 30. You know, so it's, it's a, bit, a little bit like water. And so we can show that if you have a raft that is um, reasonably strong enough, then it can carry quite high loads. And some of the loads are quite high. The funnel loads that support the roof are about 15 meganewtons. Uh, and the soil has a very low strength. But nevertheless, we have boldly gone and uh, designed out not only the passenger terminal building, but other structures, including the uh, air traffic control tower. Um, uh, this may be the last of its kind uh, in the, in the, uh, now that we're in the age of virtual air traffic control. Uh, rather, so we don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to put a small number of people, <coughs> 80 metres, excuse me, 80 metres in the air to watch planes l physically land. Um, but nevertheless, it's a huge challenge uh, it's an inverted pendulum, and uh, what we have done is uh, we've combined that um, slender tower for the observation of aircraft uh, with the service building to create, if you like, an onshore, offshore structure. Um, uh, this is the existing um, air traffic control tower uh, at Mexico City Airport, uh, a few kilometres away um, into the urban area. So we're dealing with a, uh, uh, a monster of a thing with a fixed base overturning moment of something in the order of um, uh, that. Uh, this is the current state of construction. Uh, it is a compensated structure, so what you see here is the, uh, the substructure emerging from the ground. This is from a, a six-metre deep excavation in soft ground. 
Uh, it has very shallow side slopes because we don't want failure. Um, we, we monitored during the September 19th earthquake the movement of those slopes and they moved about 40 millimeters during the event. So the, uh, the soil is, is quite well behaved and it's more or less what we uh, predicted um, under the events at, that, uh, at those sort of strain rates. Um, so here we have uh, partial, partial construction that's moving forward. The actual detail of the um, structure um, relies on base isolation. We, at an early stage, we, we couldn't deal with that uh, 2800 mega Newton meter fixed base moment. And so we have base isolated the uh, system. Uh, and this cross section shows the, uh, the basic um, situation. Uh, 480 odd piles. They're around about 15 meters deep. The, the cellular raft foundation is about uh, six meters deep. We carried out extensive cyclic uh, testing, and this is just a snapshot of what we've done, um, where we can see here, uh, this um, shows that with increasing mobilization of the static uh, undrained strength, we start to get uh, destructuration and degradation of um, uh, shear modulus. So we can go up to about 80% of the static undrained strength, and those are the nearly horizontal lines, and it just keeps on going at that sort of um, uh, more or less constant shear modulus with um, tens of, under tens of cycles of, of shaking. But if you exceed around about 80% of the static undrained strength, then you start to get destructuration and, uh, and eventual failure. And we have developed a uh, damage strain model for the clays, which looked like this. And I'll go into more detail in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, we've put in uh, various uh, cautious parts of this, which are to do with the uh, sensitivity of the um, uh, clay after, after repetitive loading. And um, we've deliberately reduced uh, the, um, uh, the strength after shaking to uh, uh, be on the safe side. Uh, we've calibrated it with the triaxial testing, and so basically we have matched the uh, extremities of these um, stress-controlled tests, and we can see the, um, uh, the blue points, the matching, and this then informs the non-mazing uh, non um, damping behavior that we put into our uh, big uh, 3D finite element modeling. Um, the blue plots uh, show the... Um, uh, degradation of shear modulus with number of cycles um, measured in the lab, and the red ones are our, our damage strain simulation. So we're erring on the um, safe side with number of cycles. In terms of monotonic behavior, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, damage strain model adequately represents the, uh, 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 the straining behavior uh, the generation of excess pore pressures and uh, a reasonably credible stress path without the dilation which uh, we can see occurring in, uh, in the real soil samples. And when we put all of this together with, the, um, uh, with a scaled um, 1985 destructive earthquake event scaled up to 1 in 2475, uh, we find that... Uh, um, the foundation system holds itself together with, with piles. Um, and we show here, because we were asked to demonstrate it, why are we having piles? What do you need piles for? Um, it shows that the amount of degradation that we can see or predict uh, in these uh, very soft clays is controlled uh, pretty effectively by the, uh, uh, the piles uh, in the, even with a lower bound capacity on the right-hand side compared to the no-pile situation where uh, the, the redder it is, the greater the amount of degradation under the, uh, under the earthquake load. And if we look at uh, uh, the behavior of upper bound piles and lower bound piles, they move from compression, that's negative values, into tension, but they, the mechanism does not form. Uh, the pressures remain in compression at that interface. And so the whole system just manages to keep itself in a stable condition. 
during that uh, extreme event. Um, and finally, to look very quickly at the passenger terminal building, uh, here we've created our own city block, if you will. It's about 1.6 kilometers long. It's a big, monolithic, unjointed um, raft, which is about uh, 1.3 to 1.5 meters thick. And uh, the structures on which, which sit on the raft are divided into 18. So it is, if you like, a, a city block with 18 different structures, all sharing one foundation. They all oscillate in different, uh, uh, different periods, different modes, but the inertial loads are all carried by this uh, monolithic raft. And when we analyze the, uh, the raft dynamically, um, the angle of propagation of um, earthquake waves is in Mexico City from the, um, uh, from the southwest. And so the earthquake waves, which is of a finite length and less than the total length of the building, we can see here that as we do a snapshot in time through an analysis, we can see that never is there a coherent sliding surface uh, across the entire uh, foundation system. And therefore, again, the whole uh, raft acts as one, if you like, city block and uh, holds itself together. There is a little bit of movement that we see, uh, but we're able to predict uh, at the ends of the wishbones, if you like, at the end. But those are predictable and uh, uh, manageable. Uh, this next photo is taken uh, on the 16th of March, so construction is well underway. Um, uh, the raft itself is built in 20 meter squares on soft clay. They settle about 60 to 80 millimetres under the weight of wet concrete and then stop settling. Um, we're in the middle of uh, building the first of the, uh, uh, the roof columns, um, which are about, in total, about 45 metres high eventually. <clears throat> and you can see in the distance uh, the edge of the Anthropocene, the edge of the, um, uh, the urban area in the distance. Uh, so you can see that we are in the middle of a lake. So, um, in conclusion, I hope that I've presented a reasonable overview of current state of practice with advanced soil models, design and analysis procedure with examples from waves, uh, trains, earthquakes and collapse loading. The written version will, of course, contain much more detail. I hopefully am able to explain myself as clearly as possible in that uh, form. Uh, to summarise, Increasing urbanization has changed the nature of geotechnical engineering. Everything is connected, and we can instrument the Anthropocene beyond mere construction <coughs> monitoring. A resilient future will require much greater feedback from performance of foundation systems. Dynamic numerical analysis can be used to calibrate soil models against extreme events. And this includes transient extreme in situ tests, such as the CPT and the pressure meter as well as output from vertical arrays of seismic accelerometers and so on and so forth. So we should try to use everything uh, as best we can to better characterize the soils. Um, we have those tools now, um, unified soil, soil models, um, enable us to progress towards performance-based design and greater resilience. We can look forward to increasing feedback from long-term instrumentation systems, um, big geotechnical data, is going to be commonplace. Um, I won't mention Cambridge Analytica in this context. Uh, we now have the tools to articulate, as you've seen from these various video images, uh, the tools to articulate to stakeholders uh, the consequences of uh, extreme events on foundation systems. I need to give thanks where they're due to these individuals. I won't say their names uh, out loud, but uh, those who are here can see their names and those who are online or wherever, likewise. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our friends in, uh, in Mexico City, in uh, UNAM, uh, Faculty of Engineering and the Institute of Engineering, uh, as well as our clients who are, uh, have their logos on the uh, left-hand side. And so I'd like to thank you for your patience and um, thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, that was excellent, Nick. I'd now like to call on Professor Tom O'Rourke of Cornell University to deliver the vote of thanks. When Nick started his talk tonight, he made historical reference to Rankine. And it reminded me of the first time I went to Scotland and was walking around in the Inner Hebrides on a geologic field trip and being lashed by the rain and the wind. And I turned around to my Scottish companion and I said, it's really raining here. And he looked at me and he says, oh no, laddie. It's not raining until it's fallen horizontally and climbing up your teeth. <laughs> William John McCoon Rankine was a gifted and plucky Scotsman whose exceptional insights into mechanics and thermodynamics made lasting contributions to earth pressure modeling as well as the design of any type of heat engine you can think of. Today, Nick O'Reardon extended the ranking tradition by delivering an exceptional lecture that combines deep insight into rate of deformation effects on soil shear modulus, with practical Anthropocene engineering involving the Holocene clays, among other places of Mexico City and San Francisco. This bravura performance demonstrates that both he and Rankine draw inspiration from the same DNA, and it's a Celtic DNA. This is not to say that Nick and Rankine are cut from the same cloth, but rather to affirm that they share the same intellectual gene pool. They both share an inquisitive nature, a bent towards understanding and implementation of fundamentals, and a dedication to improvement where the next project continuously redefines purpose and provides new discovery. Nick's lecture focused on direct time domain finite element modeling to show how the GGMAX backbone curve has to be adjusted for strain rate so that the same basic soil model can be calibrated against high strain rate in in situ tests such as the CPT pressure meter as well as slower triaxial and faster resonant column and bender element test. He demonstrated the use of strain-based algorithms to mimic the breakdown under cyclic undrain loading of the diatomaceous Mexico City clays, and he provided examples of dynamic interaction from karst collapse adjacent to railway viaducts in South Africa, the protection against liquefaction of medium-dense sands under offshore structures using partial drainage during the passage of storm waves, resonant effects of high-speed trains, and damage effects on track ballast and piles bearing in medium dense gravels. Rankine's legacy is well celebrated this day after 57 lectures by the 58th Rankine lecture. And Nick, thanks for making the wait worthwhile. On behalf of the geotechnical engineering profession, I call for a resounding vote of thanks for a stimulating and thought provoking presentation that illustrates the intricacies of dynamic soil structure interaction and improves engineering practice for many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Nick O'Reardon for an impressive and influential ranking lecture. <laughs>